Well, we've been in the Gospel of Luke for quite a while, and uh, this morning we are still in chapter 18. If you would open your Bibles there. I'm actually just going to use the same slides from last time because we didn't quite finish, so uh, that's where we're at. Um, this actually was only a two-slide presentation, so I wasn't very elaborate with this in the first place anyway. But really, what the focus is here, first of all, in the context, we are looking at the end of Jesus' final journey towards Jerusalem. Luke devotes way more space to that narrative than any other gospel writer does. Ten chapters worth. It is the longest section in the Gospel of Luke. And he has an awful lot to say about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. What it means to take up the cross of Jesus. What it means to count the cost of following Jesus. And what Jesus' overall mission is in setting up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And these pa the passage uh, from 1815 on to the 1927 really has been focused on a series of contrasting characters who are prepared, or in some cases not prepared, for the kingdom. And so last week we talked about the little children whom Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And unless you become like a child, you're not getting into the kingdom. They, children make better disciples than most adults do, according to Jesus, and there's a lesson we ought to learn from. Secondly, we looked at a rich ruler, a real-life Pharisee. Uh, there is kind of a deliberate expansion going on of Jesus' parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector from earlier in chapter 18, because he's immediately followed by a real-life ruler of the people who is trying to justify himself and is not justified because... He still has a long way to go. And by a real-life tax collector, Zacchaeus, whom we will look at this morning. A man who did go to his house justified, whom salvation came to his house. Uh, and, of course, the story of the rich young ruler concludes with Peter's boast and Jesus' prediction of the fact that he is going to go to the cross. And this is a statement that the disciples have not yet fully comprehended. They still don't understand the real message of Jesus' mission. That the kingdom is not about who's the best. It's not about who's the most powerful. It's not about who's the smartest or who's the tallest or any other number of arbitrary criteria. It is not about who is the greatest. Rather, Jesus is setting up a kingdom where those who humble themselves will be exalted and where those who exalt themselves will be brought low and humbled. And Jesus, of course, demonstrates this by going through the ultimate self-sacrificial act of humility by going to the cross a thing that was so shameful and disgraceful in their culture a thing that could not be brought up in respectable conversation Jesus goes to that for the sake of his people he endures shame he endures suffering to set up this eternal kingdom how many kings do you know that attained power by being rejected by their constituency well, Jesus is the king of kings, and he did that. He did everything the opposite of what a normal king would do, and he triumphed over the power of the devil. This morning, we're going to pick up in verse 35 of chapter 18 and continue this series of contrasting characters. Reading verses 35 through 43. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him. What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. Luke's account does not name this blind man. Mark, in Mark chapter 10, in his parallel, identifies him as Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. Um... It's not a very creative name because the name Bartimaeus means the son of Timaeus. But uh, it's still interesting to note that. Matthew's account actually has two blind men in Matthew 20 and verses 29 through 34. But the basic story is the same in all the accounts. A blind man hears that Jesus is going, 
But he hears the crowd going by and he inquires about it. What's going on? And upon learning that it is Jesus, he calls for Jesus to have mercy on him. This sounds an awful lot like something we just heard recently, doesn't it? It the, echoes the call of the tax collector that we heard in Jesus' parable, parable. God be merciful to me, the sinner. Chapter 18 and verse 13. And this echoes something else too. Just as the disciples tried to prevent the children from coming to Jesus, the nearby crowd is trying to shut this man up. You're creating a disturbance. Jesus doesn't have time for you. We're busy with other things. We've got, we got to get where we're going. We've got to get to Jerusalem. We're way too busy to take care of your problem and your need. Never mind, of course, that Jesus himself was you know, illustrating a similar point in the parable of the Good Samaritan. You don't just leave people by the side of the road to go on and carry out your religious purposes. And the, the crowds try to shut this man up. He's creating a disturbance, but this man will not be silenced. He knows something about Jesus. And he knows something about Jesus that many of the crowd around do not seem to realize. It is remarkable that of all the people, it is a blind man that has a clearer vision of who Jesus is than any of the people that can see. And Jesus singles this man out and asks him, what do you want me to do for you? Well, man wants to receive his sight. Well, wouldn't that be obvious? <laughs> What do you want me to do for you? Oh, I, want, I want to see again. God always knows what we want. Jesus knows what this man wants. And the truth of the matter is, is that before we approach God in prayer, your heavenly Father knows exactly what you need before you ask. But still there is a lesson here about the need for persistence. Yes, God knows what you want, but He wants you to talk about it. He wants you to talk to Him. And just like any relationship you have with any other human being... You know, they would want you to communicate something to them, even if they knew what you were thinking. The same thing is true of God, who knows all things and knows all that we are thinking. God still desires us to talk to Him. And Jesus singles this man out. This man, in his persistence, therein echoing the other prayer, in, or the other parable in chapter 18 about the persistent widow, this man is persistent, like she is. And because of this man's persistence, and because of this man's faith, he is given his sight. Jesus tells him in verse 42, Your faith has saved you. Your faith has made you well. This is actually the fourth time and the last time in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus has told somebody that their faith has saved them. He said it to the sinful woman who washed his feet in chapter 7 and verse 50. He said it to the hemorrhaging woman who touched his garment in chapter 8 and verse 48. She reaches out and says, if I could just touch the fringe of his garment, I will be healed. And she touches it and she is healed. And Jesus says, your faith has saved you. He says a similar thing to the Samaritan leper. Jesus healed ten lepers. Ten people were healed on that occasion. But only one came back to thank Jesus. And that one, Jesus told him, your faith has saved you. Well, what saved the other nine guys? I guess God's mercy towards their lack of faithfulness, ultimately. Um... You know, you never see people in the Bible failing to be healed because of a lack of faith. But you do see pe Jesus tell people that your faith has saved you. And all of the people, the fourth time, of course, is this blind man of Jericho. And all of the people present see this and they give praise to God. They give glory to God. Because that's what he deserves. A second character, Zacchaeus, the tax collector... And James did not follow my request to lead. Zacchaeus was a wee little man this morning. Um, but, you know, the look of shock in the audience right now is you know, amazing. Um, the, uh, although I think that the way that song is sung kind of doesn't really convey it. It sounds like Jesus is scolding Zacchaeus in the context of the song. At least the way I heard it growing up, anyway. But let's read verses 1-10 through 10 of chapter 19. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was, and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. And when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. 
Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Um, unlike the other stories we have listed up here so far, this one is unique to the Gospel of Luke. No other Gospel tells us about Zacchaeus, the tax collector. He is a rich tax collector. I think this sets up the comparison with the rich young ruler in chapter 18. You know, Because in chapter 18, Jesus made the comment after the ruler departed, saying it's very difficult for a rich man to enter a kingdom. It's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter a ki the kingdom. In other words, it's just not going to happen without God's mercy. But this other rich guy comes on the scene and we've got to start asking ourselves, well, will this guy get into the kingdom? Is there a chance for Zacchaeus, the rich man? And just like the blind man couldn't see Jesus because of his sight, Zacchaeus can't see Jesus because of his height. So he has to climb a tree. He's Just like the blind man, Zacchaeus is determined to see Jesus. He's going to circumvent this crowd in any way he can. The blind man went through them. Zacchaeus decides to go over them. He climbs into a tree. Might have made himself look a little ridiculous in the process, but, you know, he does it anyway. And Jesus notices him, and he invites himself to Zacchaeus' house. And Zacchaeus receives Jesus gladly. Just like with the children. Just like with the blind man. All the people start to grumble. You know, the disciples grumbled at Jesus receiving children. No reason is stated, but I can't help but imagine that they thought children were disruptive or a waste of time in some fashion. The people grumbled at the confrontation with the blind man because he's making this ruckus and this disturbance. And now they grumble at Zacchaeus because he's a tax collector. You're really going to eat with this guy? You know the one person they don't grumble about? The rich ruler. They don't grumble about him. They want this guy to join their entourage. And he doesn't. Jesus makes an impossible requirement that he can't meet. Just like the Pharisees earlier who were upset that Jesus received sinners and ate with them in chapter 5 in verses 29 through 32. Or chapter 15 in verse 2 on the occasion where Jesus told the parable of the lost sheep. And Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus states his own repentance. He's not a perfect man. But he says, he's, I'm going to give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've defrauded anybody, I'll pay four times as much. The law of Moses actually specified that if you defrauded anybody or stole from anybody, you were to pay back twice as much. Exodus 22 discusses that in detail. Um, in Exodus 22 and verse 1, we learn that fourfold payments were reserved specifically for the theft and slaughter of sheep, and fivefold payments were reserved specifically for the theft and slaughter of oxen. Zacchaeus volunteers a fourfold payment of money. Like the tax collector of chapter 18, he is genuinely repentant of his sins. So can rich men enter the kingdom of God? Apparently. Rich men can enter the kingdom of God if they're willing to change themselves. That's the lesson we get from Zacchaeus. And Jesus approves of this behavior. Salvation has come to his house. He is the son of Abraham. A rich man that is destined for Abraham's bosom instead of torment. This is the opposite of the parable we read in chapter 16. In chapter 16, it was Lazarus who went to Abraham's bosom, and it was the rich man who went to torment. But here, a rich man actually is called a child of Abraham. And if God can raise up children from the stones for Abraham, like John the Baptist said in chapter 3 and verse 8, he can also raise them up from the tax collectors. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. <coughs> I think that this is important for the context of the story of the rich young ruler. You know, some people take that story and they say, well, we have everybody ought to sell everything and give it to the poor. Although I've never actually met anybody who literally did that. Um, but the story of Zacchaeus shows that's clearly not a requirement for everybody. It's a requirement for that ruler in chapter 18. Because not everybody has the same thing required of them to get into the kingdom. The truth is that the ruler probably obtained his wealth honestly, and Zacchaeus probably obtained his wealth a little bit dishonestly. And yet, Jesus is satisfied with Zacchaeus only giving up half, and he's not satisfied unless the rich ruler gives up everything. Why the difference? What makes this rich ruler, this unnamed man from chapter 18, so...
so different from Zacchaeus. Well, it had everything to do, first of all, with their attitudes. The rich ruler was interested in justifying himself. He was coming to Jesus with the approach of, well, Jesus, you know, look at me. I got all these commandments fulfilled. I'm ready to join your team. You'll be lucky to have me on your team. I'm the number one draft pick for this congregation that you're forming. The truth of the matter is, is that God does not need a one of us, does He? And the alternate thing is true of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus has a very different attitude towards it. He offers to repent up front. He doesn't tell Jesus, Jesus, I've lived my life so well, I need to be a disciple of yours. He comes to Jesus and he says, I've done a lot of things wrong, Jesus. I'm going to sell half of my possessions and give it to the poor. I'm going to repay, I'm going to repay what I owe, and I want to follow you. Repentance needs to come with conversion, or it is not a conversion at all in any sense of the word. We have to change our lives if we want to follow Jesus. We can't be satisfied with where we are. We can't look at ourselves like God is somehow lucky to have us. On the contrary, we ought to be looking for a way to improve ourselves. And if we can't find one, then I suggest to you we are blinder than Bartimaeus. But there's another difference between these two. And it's the principle of what they have to offer in the first place. And hence, what comes next? The final parable. A point of, that is driven home here. That to the one who is given much, to much, much of him will be required. A parable on faithfulness. A parable of the minas. Money usage. Uh, the New American Standard says money usage. But of course the point is not literally about money usage. It's about, in general, how we use what is given to us and how faithful we are in the little things. In verse 11 it says, While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable. Because he was near Jerusalem and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said, A noble man went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. He called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minas and said to them, Do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. And when he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that the slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him, so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared, saying, Master, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very little thing, you are to be in authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, Your mina, master, has made five minas. And he said to him, Then you are to be over five cities. Another came saying, Master, here is your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. I was afraid of you because you're an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and you reap what you did not sow. He said to him, Well, by your own words, I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you know that I am an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to the bystanders, Take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. Then they said to him, Master, he has ten minas already. I tell you that to everyone who has more, no, to everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Now this is uh, similar to a parable of the talents in Matthew 25, although the context is a little different and the, uh, the exact details of the story are a little different. I can't imagine that I don't have a hard time imagining that Jesus told the same story several different ways on multiple occasions. Um, but the people were looking on like the kingdom is going to show up at any moment, verse 11. And Jesus tells this parable. that Yeah, there's a master about to receive a kingdom, but he had to go on a journey to do it. In verse 12. And he's got a long absence, and he calls ten of his slaves together, and he entrusts them with money, and he expects them to do business until he returns well, the local citizens, of course, they don't want this guy to be in charge of them. They don't want him to rule over them. But when the master finally shows back up and receives the kingdom, he calls his slaves and gives an account. First slave has turned one mina into ten. That's pretty productive. So he's rewarded with ten cities. 
Second slave turns one mina into five. He's rewarded with five cities. There's a principle that's getting repeated here that faithfulness in the little things matters. You were faithful in a very little thing, so I'm going to entrust you with a great thing. You were faithful with a little thing, so you get reward. So what happens to a person who's not faithful with a little thing? Who's not trustworthy with a little thing? Well, there's one guy that kept his mina in a handkerchief. He didn't throw it away. He didn't lose it. He kept it safe. He kept it protected. He maintained his status quo. Is that man a faithful slave? Is that man faithful in the little things? Not according to his master. He says, you could have at least done something. You could have at least put the money in the bank and gained interest, but you chose not to do that. You are a worthless slave, he tells this man. You kept it in a handkerchief. But, but I was afraid to do anything. Explains his inaction as motivated by fear. Well, the master, you know, I mean, you reap where you've never sown. You gather where you've never scattered. Well, guess what? I'm about to reap where I've never sown and gather where or I've never scattered from you. I'm going to expect something of you. You have nothing to give. Master actually concedes his point and says, you know what? You could have at least done this and you didn't even do that. The slave didn't even do the bare minimum of what was expected of him. The mina he has is given to the ten mina man and presumably control of another city. And people start to protest and say, well, that's, that's not fair. You're just giving more to the man who has the most. You know, we're supposed to be leveling the playing field here, right? That's what the master gives, the principle. He says, no, that's not how it works. To everyone who has, more will be given. The one who does not have, I'm going to take away what he does have. It's an inversion of the principle from chapter 12 and verse 48. That to whom much is given, much will be required. To whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. And those who dared actually oppose the master, well, they're put to death altogether. So what's the point of all this? I would say, first of all, in terms of the application of this, being faithful in the little things matters. We can't blow them off. If you're the sort of people that, if we're the sort of people that flaunt the minor rules, just say, I don't care what authority says. I'm going to do what I want myself. What does that matter, right? What does that say about our attitude towards the bigger rules? You know, Adam and Eve were kicked out of a Garden of Eden over a piece of fruit. And we might protest and say, well, it was just a piece of fruit. It was just a little thing. Really, God, why are you getting so upset? It was just one piece of fruit. And it says everything about their character. Faithfulness in the little things makes a difference. It makes a difference in terms of being faithful in the big things. It's not just a piece of fruit. It says everything about who they are. You know, we could apply this on any number of levels. We might talk, for instance, about something called church attendance. Some people think that's no big deal. I don't have to come every service. It's just a little thing. Why would it matter? Why would it matter if I blow off a midweek Bible study? Why would it matter if I blow off a Sunday evening? Why would it matter if I just came an hour late and blew off the Sunday morning Bible class? Why would those things matter? They're just little things. I mean, I can't even find a scripture that specifies those times, right? But I'll tell you what, we all claim to be part of this local congregation. We all claim to be part of this local family. And when we set times to meet together, well, and then people don't show up. What does that say about our love for this family? About our faithfulness toward it? That does say something about our faithfulness in the little things. It says something about our love for the brethren, ultimately. And whether we like it or not, our love for the brethren says something about our love for the Lord. And if we can be here, and we choose not to be, that says something about our faithfulness in the little things, and it does say something about whether the Lord will entrust us with great things. I'll leave that to your consideration. The other point I think we would get from this is that we cannot borrow the spirituality of others. You know, it's almost inherent in man's thinking to be, shall we say, institutional. We can pool all our resources, we can hide behind the name and the construct and everything else. But what if these ten guys in their minas had been a local church? You know, this guy has ten minas, and this guy has five minas, and this guy has one. 
And we put them together, and guess what? Well, we got 16. We're doing good. This is a productive group. So, so, we're so great. We're so well resourceful and all that. You know what? You know what? Did the man with the one mina get rewarded for the resourcefulness of his fellows? No. Did he get rewarded for the productivity of his own fellow servants? No. He's punished for his own laziness. We will not be rewarded because we were around people who were spiritual. We will not be rewarded because we spent time with people who were spiritually minded. We will be rewarded for our spirituality because the Lord has the mercy on us. You will be, judgment is not based on... You know, judgment for me is not based on what you all do. It's based on what I do. And judgment for you is not based on what I do, but on what you do. Because we each individually, personally, have a responsibility to meet. To use our talents, our minas, our resources that God has given us to serve Him better. That's part of the meaning of discipleship. That's inherent in what it is. And it's inherent in becoming a people prepared for the kingdom. So, I leave you with these thoughts. And I hope that something I've said this morning has motivated us to go out and be better servants of the Lord in all respects. I call on us all to be persistent in our prayer, to be humble in our attitude, and to be sincere in our repentance, and to be faithful in the little things, so that when Christ returns, He will entrust us the greater things. Take out your songbooks. As we conclude this morning, of course, we traditionally offer a, um, an invitation, an exhortation, to make your life right with the Lord. Perhaps you are not a Christian, Perhaps you've never been immersed for the forgiveness of your sins. Perhaps you are a Christian and you've lost your way. You've lost sight of what really matters and you need to make it right. Whatever your need may be, that is the opportunity that is given here this morning. Won't you take advantage of that while together we stand and we sing?